good morning and happy Valentine's Day. Today, I want to talk about love. I was inspired to write this sermon after completing the trans inclusive workshop presented by two Unitarian Universalist trans men, Reverend Mikhail Slack and Alex Capitan. My thanks to both of them. I have a confession. I have had a number of misconceptions about transgender people. One is, I thought trans people felt they were all born in the wrong body. Boy, was I wrong. I had no idea of the vastly differing trans experience from one trans person to the next. I'm a little ashamed of that. I didn't understand what it was to be trans. I didn't really understand until I started to do the research for this sermon. And what I realize is I don't understand, but I'm working to understand. This morning, I'm talking about trans folk, also called transgender people, as in the T in LGBTQ. To make sure we're all on the same page, the first sentence from the Wikipedia definition of transgender says, transgender people have a gender identity or gender expression that differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. We're going to talk about some of those words because there's an awful lot of words. I'm going to address how gender shows up in the world and what it is to be trans from the perspective of a queer cis woman. And so we're clear on language. Cis means that my gender aligns with the gender I was assigned at birth. I'm not trans, but I am striving to be a trans ally. So what do I mean when I say gender? There are three major components that kind of get squished together. There's biology, expression, and identity. I am going to just talk through them. And before I forget, I'm going to share the gender bread slide just for a moment. So some of you will remember that years ago, I did a whole day long workshop on gender. And the gender bread person keeps evolving. But you'll see here the three areas I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about biological sex, I'm going to talk about expression, and I'm going to talk about identity. So let's go through those. Your biological sex, that includes your anatomy, chromosomes, hormone levels. The whole cornucopia of factors was erroneously divided into two categories by our culture. For centuries, we've been taught that a person could only be female or male. However, biologically, one in a hundred bodies differs from what is considered typical. I kind of cringe using that word. There are different combinations of chromosomes. People can be XXX or X or XY, and there are hugely varying hormone levels in people, making millions of combinations of genders. However, biological sex is simply one part of gender. The second is expression. How do you express your gender? This includes everything that gets mapped onto us by our dominant culture, our behavior, our appearance, preferences, roles, speech patterns, the pitch of our voice, and occupation, and so much more. Expression is also influenced by numerous factors, some of which include race, class, geography, privilege, and age. The third component of gender is identity, your inner sense of being, your understanding of your gender and how you describe yourself. Are you a woman? Are you gender fluid? Are you MTF, male to female? Are you gender queer? Intersex, two-spirit, agender, FTM, female to male. A man, bigender, mixed gender, trans. There are more than 500 unique gender identity terms. Having a broad vocabulary for gender identity gives us the ability to claim language to describe ourselves. Our gender expression and identity are hugely influenced by gender roles, which are the set of societal norms which dictate behavior. If you are assigned male at birth, you're given an awful lot of blue things. You're also given a very narrow set of career choices your expectations on how, and I'm gonna actually go back to that, you're actually given a specific set of career choices. And maybe there's another gender that has a more narrow set of choices. There are expectations on how you express yourself physically, emotionally, and you are expected to be attracted to females. If you are assigned female at birth, there are cultural expectations that women are more emotionally and physically available to people in particular ways. 
there's also an assumption that you want to be a mother. But what if you don't follow the rules? What if the gender you were assigned at birth or how you are culturally expected to express that gender doesn't feel like your true self and you truly identify as trans? It isn't a great, great leap to understand that the, the gender binary, i.e. exclusively male and female, it's gonna give you a vis visual on that, exclusively male and female is a system of oppression. There are thousands upon thousands of people in the world who don't identify as male or female and have been forced to choose between only two genders, causing there to be an erasure or silencing of trans people. As trans people have discovered, you must fit into the system to have legitimacy in society. Many trans folks end up trying to fit into one gender box or another without acknowledging the fact that neither box really fits. Imagine the harm this does to people. The gender binary is embedded into all of our lives. How have gender rules affected you? When did you realize you had a gender? Not only that you had a gender, but there were rules that you were expected to follow. 40 years ago in high school, I remember being told that girls couldn't do triple jump because it would impact our ability to have babies. So a bunch of my friends and I would go into the sports field that was right beside where the staff had lunch and we'd all do triple jump. <laughs> there is one commonality for trans people. They've been questing and they've embarked on a journey to figure out who they are. They've plumbed the depths of self-doubt and discovered the fear that comes with constant rejection. Rejection of who they are and of their truth, not just once, but multiple times from society, family, friends, and from their spiritual communities. While some trans kids I know have been welcomed and encouraged to be who they are by their families, many have not. If you, are trans, if you are not trans, then I invite you to think about what it's like to be trans in our culture, both the dominant culture and the culture of this congregation. I watched the movie Disclosure on the recommendation of John Pulleyblank, and it really opened my eyes and I highly recommend it, but it's an extremely difficult movie to watch. It's evident the way trans people see themselves portrayed in our culture, and, and it's appalling and you see video clip of video clip of how trans people have been portrayed by Hollywood. Trans people are ridiculed. They're seen as less than. They're on the receiving end of sexual violence. And if the majority of the population only understands tra the trans perspective from the media created in Hollywood, then how can we understand? How can we acknowledge? How can we welcome trans people? This is gonna be a long time coming, but we can do something about that. You know, if we view a trans man as a man who used to be a woman, yeah, this is a statement of fact, but it's also a piece of his medical file. And I'm not sure I'm defined by having asthma. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm not, and it's not a piece of my medical file I necessarily wanna talk about. So if we're talking to a trans man, let's think outside of the box of what a piece of that person's medical file is. What if we thought of trans people like this slide? Now, this is a little bit of a stretch, but go with me on this one. I saw this and at first I was like, eh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna share that because I'm not sure that maybe someone would feel that they had a more male right arm and the rest of their body all identified as female. Um, but what it does is it gives you an idea of there's just so many more ideas of gender than what we have been taught. So I thought that just gave us a nice visual of, of different, different ways that people experience the world. Trans folk are in a huge variety of, in, let's try that again. Trans folk are people with a huge variety of identity and lived lives. In 2016, the US carried out the second national transgender discrimination survey which had 27,000 trans respondents. The survey found that trans people are not surprisingly, all ages from every part of every state have jobs in every sector. Basically, 
trans folks are in every facet of life in the United States, and I'm pretty sure this is true for Canada too. Let's take a moment to address pronouns. I've heard people question, why are there so many pronouns? It's because trans people have had to force language to make space for them because they've not been acknowledged. Imagine if you didn't have language to define yourself. Did you know that in 2019, the Merriam-Webster word of the year was the singular pronoun they? I know it takes some getting used to, but if we question the use of the plural pronoun they for a trans person, we erase trans folk from our language. Did you know, and I know this thanks to Dick, that according to Wikipedia, they used as the singular goes back to the Middle English of the 14th century, but it fell out of common usage. Just gonna show you a quick slide of pronouns. If you're not familiar with the array of pronouns, this just gives you some idea of the huge array of gender neutral pronouns. We can come back to that later in the forum if you're interested. The 2016 American study of trans folk found that 63% of trans people identify as spiritual, often because they've had intense spiritual journeys to claim their authentic selves. Part of that discovery takes a profoundly spiritual turn. Trans people have had to forge their own path and answer a call that goes outside of our culturally dictated normative ways of moving through the world. Trans people have so many gifts to give that are beyond body parts. How do we make sure our congregation is a welcoming one? We've begun to have conversations about pronouns. First thing this morning, I invited people to add pronouns to their names. We'll also be talking about gender neutral bathrooms. Um, some of you may remember that James Bay New Horizons where we used to meet doesn't have a gender neutral bathroom. So that's gonna be a conversation that we have with James Bay New Horizons because clearly if trans folks can't use the bathroom, they definitely cannot get their spiritual needs met. But it isn't enough to just create access because that doesn't provide a real opportunity for relationship building. Trans people have been spiritual leaders over the course of centuries. Around the world, shamanic communities felt that a person who combined both male and female characteristics could connect more directly with a transcendent spiritual realm. Many religions believe that trans people are linked to something greater than themselves in a really powerful way. I would like to invite us as a congregation to talk about how to create an environment that's trans affirming. How do we make everybody feel at home here? We honor our first principle, of course, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And while the trans experience isn't mine, I have been misgendered all my life. As someone who is six foot tall and has very short hair, at least once a week, I will walk into a store and I'll be greeted with, can I help you, sir? At least 20 times, I've been told extremely rudely that I am in the wrong bathroom. Imagine forcing that type of oppression, sorry, facing that type of oppression on a daily basis. It takes intention, hard work, and time to make congregations inclusive. We are so steeped in the dominant culture that it really takes work to undo it. We are not taught to put our culture under the microscope. The dominant culture is tied to settler roots where being white and male is centered. Anything other is simply other. We are not intentional as a congregation about the culture that we create. If we're not, then the dominant culture just fills the void. This is a time to look at how our congregation works. Who is heard? Who is silenced? Who has the power? Who has the seat at a table? who doesn't have a seat at the table. So how do we become better? What would a radical welcome look like? Sadly, there's not a checklist that says 10 easy ways to make your community more welcoming to trans folk. We are being called to ship from a place of, how can I avoid offending a trans person to how can I truly offer care to each person I interact with, no matter how they self-identify. A move from, how can I intellectually master language or pronouns, to how can I release the need I feel for overthinking a situation, to a place of finding a heart connection. A word of caution, if suddenly everyone has to put a pronoun on their Zoom name, 
then maybe there's folks that this doesn't feel safe for. Equally, if more of us make our pronouns visible and those pronouns are ignored, this deepens the harm. When the most marginalized feel the most welcome, then everyone will feel welcomed and beloved. What is it to be a beloved community? For me, it's showing up with an intense amount of openness. Beloved community does not presume commonality. It is not like-minded. Instead, beloved community is being here and being like-hearted. Trans folks, you are a part of this beloved community. As a leader in this congregation, I am listening to your experience here at Capitol. And I want to ensure you that you, I want to ensure that you feel you are a valued part of our community. We usually meet the spiritual needs of those folks who are in the majority, not in the margins. One of the things that Reverend McCall and Alex Capitan shared as part of the Trans Inclusive course that really struck home for me was the way society treats trans folk now is the way lesbians and gays were treated in the 1980s. Now this I do relate to. I identified as a lesbian for a decade in the 80s and 90s and I didn't feel safe living in Toronto. So at 22, I traveled to London, England. I thought I'd feel safer there and I did feel a modicum safer there. I was stunned and amazed that there was a lesbian and gay center. And I remember the first time I went, I stood across the street for about an hour looking, is anybody watching me? Am I gonna be safe going into this haven of safety? And when the two presenters talked about what it was like to be out in the 80s and 90s, and that's what it's like to be a trans person now, I felt that in my heart. My friends, we have work to do. How do we celebrate each other in our fullness? We have to build space for people. We have to make room for all the ways that people show up. It takes practice and time. Let us strive to be in relationship with everyone that arrives on a Sunday morning, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time. You are welcome to be part of this spiritual community. I hope you remember the line from the song that I played before, The Pebbles of Joy and Concern. The song was called, Do Not Leave Your Cares at the Door. And the lyric said, every story is sacred here. My friends, every story is sacred here. Let us join together in song and sing the protection mark.